Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio. In this video, I build one table my way and one table the way a viewer assures me will sell for 10 times as much. Then I auction them both off and see who's right. So here is the backstory on this build. I love going through the comment section here on YouTube. I read them every single day of my life. If you've ever left me a comment, there's a very good chance that I've read it, responded to it, or maybe even posted it at the end of one of my videos. And believe it or not, most of the comments are actually really, really nice, but there are occasional angry or mean comments. And that doesn't mean that the angry or mean comments are necessarily wrong though. And I got this one a little while ago and it stuck with me. He said this, he said, you are aware there are other woods besides walnut, right? But I guess you only copy what you see other people do. Try adding color to a piece for once. Blue, yellow, green, purple, anything but walnut. Probably sell for 10 times what a regular boring piece would sell for. Now, generally when I get a comment like this, I try to craft a moderately sarcastic reply, post it to my Instagram stories and just move on. But I'll admit this guy got to me a little bit and I think it's because he's not entirely wrong or maybe he's mostly right. I do use walnut probably a little too much. Most of the things I make are some version that I've seen somewhere else. So why don't I use this as an opportunity to maybe learn something? So here's what I'm gonna do. I am building two tables. I'm building one out of walnut and I'm gonna do one that is a wildly weird blue table, kind of an electric guitar looking one. And I'm gonna build both of them to the best of my abilities. I'm not trying to win this with the walnut because what we're gonna do in the end is we're gonna auction both of these tables off. 100% of the proceeds are gonna go to Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I hope that I'm wrong. I hope this blue table actually sells for 10 times what the walnut one is. I'm fairly skeptical that it will, but I can't wait to see what actually happens with this. All of the wood that I'm using for both tables is left over from larger projects, but this is definitely not a scrap wood project because the walnut that I'm using here is left over from the $18,000 coffee table build video I did a few months ago. It is a pretty rare Bastogne walnut that is hands down the most beautiful walnut that I've ever seen. And the base, stem, and top are all gonna be crafted from that same wood, from that same slab. And I'm even gonna reach out to this customer and tell him that I'm auctioning off a table that would perfectly complement his coffee table to maximize our chances at raising the most for charity. But that doesn't mean that I'm skimping on the maple either, the blue one. It's gonna be made entirely from quilted maple, the same stuff they do the high-end guitars out of. And generally those guitars, they do just the top out of kind of a thin layer of that quilted maple. I'm doing the base, stem, and top all out of a highly figured quilted maple because again, I'm not trying to win this with the walnut and prove that I knew what I was doing all along. I hope that blue maple outsells this walnut by 10 times. I'm gonna be using a pretty cool trick for cutting a circle using my router table. And since this top is 23 inches, I need to measure half that distance and make a mark. And half of 23 is obviously 12 and a half, which is what I marked. Now I drill an eighth of an inch hole and I use the top of a 16 penny nail to act as my pivot. Now I drill another eighth of an inch hole in this walnut piece and this actually fits so easily for once, I was excited. However, then I realized that half of 23 isn't 12 and a half, which is why it is sticking out there and that router bit should be under the wood. So went back to the drawing board, found out that half of 23 is actually 11 and a half and yeah, this looks a little bit better. I've never seen anybody else use this same trick for cutting circles on a router table, but A, that doesn't mean that nobody ever has, and B, doesn't mean that it's a good idea because this seems pretty safe to me, but maybe I'm missing something. So if you know why this is wildly dangerous, definitely let me know because I certainly don't want anybody getting hurt or if I'm being honest, I really don't want anybody to sue me because they got hurt, but we're really splitting hairs here and also, originally this video was gonna be like 40 minutes long until my favorite and only employee, Scott the video guy, found a way to do this split screen editing. So we're gonna be building these kind of in tandem because so much of the build was essentially the same from one table to the next that we're gonna be doing a side-by-side -side build of both the walnut and the blue table. I've always felt that I'm probably about an average woodworker. I'm pretty good at building epoxy tables, but by far my best skill and what I'm most passionate about is YouTube and social media. And that might be a surprise to some of you, but probably isn't a surprise to others. And 
I owe all of my success and anything I've done to YouTube and social media. Going back to when I had a little side hustle, trying to sell some tables out of my garage, I started a YouTube channel just so I could hopefully get a few more customers. And it's also where I get the most questions and so much so that over the last year, myself and some other big creators have been working on creating a course that outlines kind of a step-by-step -step guide to having success on YouTube. And it's one of those things that we can't guarantee your success or we don't know what's gonna happen, but we can guarantee you will skip the learning curve. And this is incredibly in depth. I brought in the best people at their respective skill. I have Brad from Fix This, Build That, Sam from DIY Huntress, John from Lincoln Street Woodworks, and Chris from Four Eyes Furniture. And this course is over four hours long. We're gonna teach you how to not just get viewers, but keep them watching the common pitfalls. And at the end of this, our goal is that everybody should be able to be generating a thousand dollars a month from their social media side hustle. If not much, much more, maybe you want to go full time. This is the course that is going to help you skip that learning curve. So it is live as of today. If you want some more information on that, there's a link in the video description. I mentioned that I'm about an average woodworker, but you don't even need to be an average woodworker to accomplish what I've done here so far. It's all pretty basic. However, I do have some way above average woodworker tools. I am essentially like the guy that has a $6,000 set of custom made golf clubs and is like a 19 handicap. And I'm not ashamed by it either. I love buying tools and I will take all the help I can get to hopefully be slightly above average. And to attach this stem to the base and the top, I used a single domino and epoxy here. And this is actually gonna be really cool. I've never made a table this way. Normally I have a top that comes off of the base. This is gonna be a fixed base and top. So it's all gonna be made from one continuous piece of wood. And what I'm gonna do is hopefully hand sculpt these into something really, really cool looking. But again, I've never made a table this way. That one's interesting looking. I. I hate the way it looks right now, just so you know. Um, the last thing I want it to look like is like a toadstool, and <laughs> okay. it's the only thing it looks like right now. But I think we can cover it into something cool, but yes, it does look ridiculous, so I pick up on your tone, and it's appreciated. Over the past few years, I've made a number of these hand sculpted or power carved table bases, and I feel like each time I get a little bit better, but I am not just trying to be humble when I say that I am not an artist and I really think an actual artist could take this to another level. And it's not that I'm not pleased with how they turn out. I'm actually really, really thrilled with the last at least several of these table bases that I've made. I think they're really cool, but it's just because I don't know what I don't know. And I look at the artists that do the, the chainsaw carving where they can look at a log and then turn it into an octopus crawling up Aquaman's leg or something like that, or that guy that carves the animals into the tabletops. I could never do that with any amount of training. And the point that I'm trying to make is if you are one of these artists, if you are one of these people with actual skill and vision, I really think that more people should be exploring this power carved furniture because as someone without a lot of skill, I'm able to sell these for a pretty good amount of money. And I really think that we could get this to the next level if we got some actual artists in there doing this power carving. So just a random thought, if there's anybody out there, I highly encourage you to try to get them to try to sell some of this more hand sculpted furniture. One of the tips I can offer you if you wanna try this power carving is start your transition at each end where the base meets the stem and where the top meets that stem. Because if you start carving right in the middle of that shaft section, it's really hard to get like a continuous curve going from the center of the shaft all the way to the base and the top. So that's why you see that transition started there at each end, makes it much, much easier to get kind of a congruent flow through the whole table. Anytime you remove a lot of material from one side of a piece of wood, you risk the other side warping or twisting, which is why when you're running a board through a planer, you run one pass through one side, then you flip it over, do the other side, then flip it over and just keep doing it that way. And this is why I've never built one of these tables this way because I am slightly afraid and slightly terrified that as I remove a ton of material from the bottom of this top, it's gonna warp or twist and the same thing goes for the bottom. I only have one shot at this and basically I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping that this wood is stable enough that as I remove all this material from one side and none from the other, that it actually stays flat. And I won't really know until I get it finished or essentially ready for finish if this wood isn't gonna deflect. 
This is a spoke shave and it is one of my favorite hand tools. I love using it for removing these high spots, kind of the lumpiness left from that power carving, but I'm not sure this is the preferred way to use it. If you get on Instagram, I've found or I've seen that the preferred way to use this is you take it up to a piece and you just remove like half an eyelash width with it. Take a step back, don't look at the camera, admire your piece like you are Michelangelo casting the final chisel stroke in the statue of David and then walk away because that seems to be the preferred way to use a spoke shave, but I like this way too. In some of my first sculpted pieces, I found I did a really poor job managing a consistent transition where the floor met the table base, or in this case, where the stem meets the table top. So I have a new idea and I think it's actually pretty genius. I think probably a normal to good woodworker would have thought of this initially, but better late than never. And here's what I'm gonna do. This is a tool I rarely use. I should probably use it more often. It's called a marking gauge and you can kind of set your depth there. It's got a sharp little end on it and this will give me a perfectly accurate mark so I can hopefully just carve right up to that mark and it will be absolutely the same all the way around the top, which will take all of the eyeballing out of this and I can just carve right up to my mark and you'll see a pretty good image of what I'm doing here. You can see the line there and I'm just carving right down to it, trying not to go past it. If I get just close to it, I'll leave a little bit for the sander and yes, I'm doing all this in flip flops. I don't need your judgment. By popular demand, I'm gonna really limit how much sanding you have to see, but just know it was a lot. It wasn't nearly as bad as my sculpted cabinet I did last month, but probably maybe a day and a half or so of sanding. And I'm using 40 grit here to just remove all of those carving marks and it wasn't too bad, but I did take it up to about 220 grit. There were two holes in this tabletop and I knew that I was gonna to have to address these eventually. And these are from where the wood supplier pins it or checks the slab for moisture content. And I'm always working on new, better ways to hide these holes. And I did a method recently that was okay, but I had a person comment and give me a much better idea than I come up with. My original idea was just to cut a little piece like this and then kind of hand sand it into roughly a cone shape and hope that it fit in there pretty tight. But here's the idea that my viewer came up with, and I am so sorry I forgot their name. I wish I would have saved it, but he told me to put it into the chuck of a drill, put it on a sander, and that way you're guaranteed a perfect cone shape. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So just know that I thank you and I apologize for not getting your name to be able to give you a shout out and credit for this, but this is gonna work pretty well. At least I hope it will. The problem is getting the color just right on these crazy colored slabs. So I put just a little dab of wood glue, tapped it in there. This one on the end, I had to use super glue because I didn't really have a good way to get a clamp on there and it is going to leave a little bit more of a mark than the wood glue but it's the best that i could come up with i let the glue cure overnight and normally when i use this flush cut saw i like to put like a playing card down or some painter's tape something to prevent the saw from scratching the wood surface but i thought i could go just easy enough and not leave any marks and it actually worked this time so it shows what happens when you just take a little bit of time Used my rasp there to clean this up best I could. Came back with my hand sander after I had the rasp all cleaned up. And it's always a little bit nerve wracking trying to see how you did here. And I'll be honest, I didn't do the best job with the color. It was just a little bit off, but not too bad. Whenever I'm making one of these tables, I like to kind of hollow out the center section of the base. So it's just a nice small ring that sits perfectly flat. And just something I learned from looking at cereal bowls and other tables and buckets and anything that sits on a flat surface, it's much better to have a small ring instead of that big wide surface. So this is a new method for me though. I have this cool carving disc and it leaves a really clean, really cool pattern. It's just a little bit time consuming and a little bit messy and found a couple high spots left there. Wanted to make sure I got those carved out. And yeah, just kind of a nice, cool custom touch to the bottom of these tables. Okay, this is when the build gets really interesting to me because the finished job on both of these tables is just so freaking different. This is some regular tap water or I guess hose water. I don't know if hose water is actually tap water. And this is trans tint dye. This is a blue dye. And contrary to the guy's comment, I have worked with colors before, just never really on a piece of furniture. This is an LED cured hard wax oil that is gonna be going on the walnut. But again, way different than what is going on the blue table. and. I normally don't apply the dye with a brush, but for the blue one, I kind of needed it to get in those grooves. And 
The other one, I'm just using a regular white pad, just like I would with Rubio or something like that. And you can see this is very, very blue, shockingly blue. So I really hope that this commenter knows what he's talking about because there is no going back now. Speaking of unique tables, I was talking with Scott the other day and he was asking me about my most viewed video of all time, the fire and epoxy table, the burnt wood with epoxy. And he asked what happened to that table and I had said it's just actually in a closet in my house somewhere. And he asked why and I was like, I don't know, I don't really have a use for it and I, for some reason I didn't want to sell it. And he told me that I should host a giveaway. He said that the viewers would probably like a chance to win my most popular video of all time. And I was like, yeah, maybe they will. So that's what we're doing. I don't like to announce my giveaways early in the videos because I want them to be to the actual fans or the people that stick around in the videos. But we are giving away the fire and epoxy table. This is my biggest giveaway I've ever done. It's my most popular video, 30 million views here on YouTube. It's actually a really cool piece. I just kind of rebuffed and polished it so it would look really nice for whoever wins it. It is open worldwide. I'll ship this thing anywhere in the world. It is, again, it's probably the biggest giveaway I've ever done. So if you want more information on that giveaway, there's a link in the video description. I'm thrilled to report that both the base and the top stayed perfectly flat on both tables. I was a little bit worried about some distortion from the power carving, but everything is spot on. And here's what I'm gonna do to give a little bit more pop to this tabletop here. This is an aqua dye. I didn't want solid blue the whole way through. So I'm gonna do kind of a turquoise fade or a blue to turquoise. And if you think that it would have looked better solid blue and you're really upset that I'm now doing this turquoise fade, Maybe leave me a comment and I'll probably build another table just for the video because clearly I am susceptible to the comment section. But this was pretty lengthy, but the cool thing about the die is if you don't like it, you can just sand it off and do another layer. It's a really a pretty fun process. The finish on the left or walnut table is an LED cured hard wax oil. It cures literally instantly or like maybe in a half a second. It is just the coolest technology I've ever seen. The table on the right, the blue one, is a 2K acrylic. It's a spray finish, so it's much more of a pain. I love this LED cured hard wax oil, but it just wouldn't work on that blue table, at least the look that I was going for. Some of you are probably wondering, who are these tables actually for? They are so highly custom. Who's the target demographic here? And I would say this, if you've ever seen an old movie and there's an old shipping tycoon and he's sitting in his mansion in a dark room lit by only a fireplace and he's sitting there contemplating revenge, of the competing shipping tycoon. Eventually he gets so enraged that he takes that glass of brandy and he throws it into the fireplace. That glass of brandy would have sat on the walnut table, but not the blue table. That guy certainly wouldn't buy that one. I'm not positive on the blue table because this wasn't my idea, but I envision somebody that lives on a coast. There is nobody in the Midwest that would buy this table. They have to be in California or New York. I'm picturing like a New York suburb art gallery or music store that has a swanky name in the suburb like NoHo or Woho or something like that. That's who I envisioned buying the blue table. Much different demographic than the walnut table. I mentioned earlier we're going to be auctioning both these pieces off independently, seeing which one generates more revenue. Again, 100% of proceeds are going to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Don't try to cancel me like the Oprah and The Rock. I am not recouping any money from this. 100% is going to Make-A-Wish. And in the past, I've hosted auctions on eBay. And eBay is pretty much the most terrible platform in the world because nobody has to pay and there's no consequences if they don't pay. Here's a quick back and forth from the last item that allegedly sold on eBay. First, he sent me this photo and then said, bap, 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 ba. I said, where are you located anyway? Not sure how to respond to that. He said, dude, I put a bid on that shit as a meme. I didn't actually expect to win it. I don't haste 12K to spend on a table. I said, ah, gotcha. He said, sorry for wasting your time. It's a cool piece though. I said, getting my time wasted as part of the job description. Lots of people without much to do there. He said, true that, AU COVID vaccinated. I replied, oh, we're not like buddies now. I'm going to text back and forth. I hope you find that friend though. So the point of this story is that we are no longer using eBay. We're going to be hosting the uh, auction on my own website. We have a few safeguards that will hopefully prevent these fake bids from happening. Again, everything's going to charity and I hope that the blue one sells for more than the walnut. I truly do. 
All right, every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week we'll keep it simple. Start your question or comment with either blue or brown, meaning which one do you think is gonna sell for more? And that way I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video. And we'll do my best to answer your questions and comments first. Thank you so much, have a great week. That one actually turned out a lot cooler than I thought it would. I'm really happy with it. I think for my first blue job, it really pops. There's gotta be a better way to say that. On the next Blacktail Studio. I cheated a little bit. <laughs>